Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan. Um, I work at a little company called Magnetic here in the city. Hi, Dan. Oh. I'm, I've, sp I've finally made this a thing. Is, oh, okay. All right. Um, well, I'll just keep going. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm here today to talk about um, performance testing in Python, um, or rather performance testing and profiling in Python. Um, and uh, we'll see um, how these two techniques, plus uh, one other that didn't make it into the title, um, can form a virtuous cycle of performance improvement. Um, so here's a little bit of what we're going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> we'll begin with a review of the types of performance testing, um, how to do some profiling using the tools that are built into the Python standard library, um, how to uh, use instrumentation efficiently um, within your code, and then uh, just a, a quick sort of review of how to tie all these things together. Um. Uh, so, uh, so according to uh, Wikipedia, um, which is where I cribbed this list from, there are four different types of performance testing. Um, this sort of came uh, when I was sort of initially thinking about this presentation, um, came a little bit as a surprise to me. Um, I think a lot of us just think of sort of one thing which we often call a load test. Um, and it turns out at least that, that most people, are, or at least that I, um, when I think of the word load test, um, what I'm actually thinking of is this thing which is, according to Wikipedia, sort of officially called a stress test. Um, and so the idea of a stress test is that you want to um, sort of throw a whole lot of load at your application. So suppose that we're talking about uh, sort of a request response, like a web application. Um, basically throw as much at it as we can until we find out the point at which it breaks. Um, so as I said, I think a lot of people confuse this with load test, which is actually a slightly different thing. Um, so a load test is um, actually a, a, a similar sort of test. So you throw a lot of load at your application, um, but you do so in a way that is at a sort of consistent and controllable and expected level of load. Um, so this might look like uh, if I know that my application gets, um, you know, 1,000 requests per second, um, then I'm going to generate a load test, which is going to throw 1,000 requests per second at this application. Uh, and I can sort of study and measure how it performs under those conditions. Um, so just to, to sort of return to a stress test for a second, the, the difference here is that um, it's sort of more of an adversarial approach. So in a stress test, if my load, <clears throat> my application usually gets 1,000 requests per second, uh, I might set up the stress test so that I'm throwing 10,000 or 50,000 requests per second at it. Um, sort of assuming that I can even generate that much load. Um, so a stress test is, is really uh, about answering the question, you know, how much load can my application take? Um, and it's really good for sort of identifying where that breaking point is, especially if you have sort of a, a series of stress tests in which you increase the load um, step by step. You can find out at what point does the response time become too slow, at what point do I sort of overwhelm a database or uh, run out of disk space on the machine because the logs are too big or, or something of that nature. Um, so a load test uh, is a little bit uh, less of sort of an attack on your application. So what we're really trying to answer uh, with a load test is, is the question of sort of what if. So um, if my normal production load is 1,000, uh, maybe I'll run a load test just with a constant load of 2,000 requests per second. Let's see what happens um, at that level. Uh, it's really good for things like capacity planning. Um, so uh, if I'm you know, releasing a new version of my code, I want to see uh, normal production load is 1,000. Can I still stand up to that with this new version of the code? Um, how many servers do I need to run uh, in order to support this many requests per second and so on? Uh, so the third type, according to Wikipedia, is something that they call a spike test. Um, again, this is very sort of similar to the previous two. Um, the major difference here is that uh, unlike in a stress test and a load test, uh, in a spike test, you have sort of a constant level of load and then it suddenly increases. Um, and suddenly is really important here. It's not sort of a gradual ramp up over time. Um, this is to simulate something like, uh, you know, if my blog was on the front page of Hacker News, uh, which actually happened to me, um, then, uh, you know, you're suddenly going to go from getting maybe a few requests per second to hundreds or thousands of requests per second. And so, so what sort of happens under those situations? Um, this is also good for sort of simulating what might happen if you had uh, some sort of production incident. <clears throat> Maybe half of your web servers went down, and the remaining half had to handle twice as much load very suddenly, uh, or some sort of deployment bug. Maybe uh, you realize halfway through a rollout that half of your servers aren't answering requests at all, something like that. 
Um, and the question that we're really trying to answer here is, uh, is my, my code, or, or really more my application as a whole, uh, is it adaptable? Can it stand up to this amount of load uh, and to sudden changes in the load? Uh, and finally, there's, there's one more type of performance testing called a soak test. Uh, and the difference here is that uh, a soak test will typically run for much longer than any of the other three types of tests that we've been talking about. Uh, so here you might run it for uh, hours, days, or even weeks uh, if you sort of have the, the hardware and the, the ability to do that. Um, and the question that we're trying to answer here is, is you know, what happens over a longer period of time? Um, do I run out of file handles? Do I run out of disk space? Stuff like that. <clears throat> Um, so uh, at Magnetic, uh, we run a really high volume uh, web platform that's dealing with um, hundreds of thousands of requests per second, um, 24 hours a day. Uh, so load testing is really important to us, and, or sorry, I should say performance testing is very important to us. Uh, and we've sort of developed internally a, a couple of best practices about how to implement it effectively. Um, so I think number one is, is that uh, <clears throat> in order to get uh, sort of reliable results and the ability to interpret the results from your performance tests, it's very important to uh, isolate your performance tests from as many external influences as you can. Um, so for us, what this means is that we actually have a dedicated performance testing environment that has copies of many of the production components, so databases, uh, <clears throat> web servers, uh, all the different sort of bits of plumbing that they all connect together with. Um, this is obviously very expensive. Hello? Oh. Uh, this is uh, fairly expensive, but it actually uh, pays off. Because we're running this service that has to be on 24-7, uh, it's very important for us to be able to study and, and understand what happens under different scenarios. Um, if you're in a situation, uh, or if you're in a, a hosting provider of something like Amazon, uh, this can actually be fairly cheap, <clears throat> um, especially if you combine it with something like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, et cetera, for configuration management you might be able to just sort of spin up this environment very easily, uh, run a test for an hour or two, and then spin it down. You don't have to pay very much for it. Um, one other thing that's worth noting here is that uh, at Magnetic and, and sort of in general, um, this performance testing environment doesn't need to be uh, as big or as capable or as uh, have as many machines in it as your production environment does. Um, so what we do is, uh, uh, let's see. Our performance testing environment is about uh, 1 20th the size of our production environment. Um, so we know uh, both from experience and from how we've designed it that uh, if we run, say, uh, a load test or a stress test, that we can basically multiply that number by 20, and that tells us um, what our capacity in production is. Um, <clears throat> so the second sort of really important best practice, uh, I actually should put this one first, um, is that it's really important to be very consistent in the way that you generate load in your performance testing environment. Um, so like any other sort of testing, like unit testing, like integration testing, uh, if you can't sort of reproduce it, uh, it's not really gonna tell you very much about your application or about your platform or how components work well together. Um, so there's a really easy win here, and this is in fact what we actually do at Magnetic. Um, we take logs out of production uh, and we just replay those uh, into our performance testing environment. Um, once we have this uh, sort of repeatable testing, then that lets us really experiment with, okay, if I tweak this setting, or if I rewrite this bit of code, or if I stop calling that bit of code, um, what does that actually do to our overall performance profile? Um, this is a really valuable way to, um, without a lot of risk and without having to invest a lot of time, uh, to be able to, to sort of begin a cycle of continuous improvement um, into in your performance of your application. Uh, okay, so um, next up, uh, the next sort of tool in our tool belt um, is profiling. Um, in Python, it turns out that this is pretty easy, sort of following along with the Python um, sort of mantra of batteries included. Um, in the standard library, there's a couple of different modules that let you do profiling and a couple, uh, well, one module which lets you uh, sort of understand and interpret the results uh, of your profiling runs. Um, so for what I suspect are historical reasons, and I haven't actually sort of studied this in detail, uh, there's two different profiling modules. One is named Profile, one is named C-Profile. Um, basically, you should just always use C-Profile. Um, it does the same things, it has the same API, and it's just a little bit faster. 
Um, and then there's a third module called pstats, which lets you sort of interpret the results. Um, and we'll take a look at this uh, in a second. Uh, however, unfortunately, um, and also like much of the, C the Python standard library, um, the documentation for these guys is not really included. Um, so I'm actually going to do um, a little demo in a moment. Uh, and finally, uh, the API for these things is really just really, really terrible. And the best way to use it is sort of hidden within the documentation. Um, so avoid run, avoid run CTX. Uh, they're no good and they won't tell you anything useful about your code. Uh, and instead, what you should do is something that looks like this. Um, so what we're doing here is we're importing the C profile module, uh, creating a profile object, which is the guy that's actually going to begin collecting data about uh, what function calls our code is making, uh, when each of them begins, when each of them ends, which of course then tells us uh, how long each of them took. Um, and this lets you sort of enable and disable the profiler to cover specific sections of your code uh, that you might care about. Um, this is by far the most flexible way to work with the profiles, profilers that are in the standard library. Um, every time you call uh, enable and disable um, in a pair like this, um, it's going to sort of accumulate results from within those sections uh, back into this profile object. Uh, so you can actually just sort of analyze um, specific sections of your code uh, and ignore all of the, the other stuff that you might not be interested in. Uh, the standard library doesn't give this to you in something like a context manager or a decorator, or at least as of 2.7 it doesn't. Um, but it's really simple to uh, turn this into one of those two things, and there's lots of examples on the internet uh, of people doing exactly that. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, I just want to show one last thing here, or, or point out one last thing. Uh, so after you sort of run all of these uh, different sections of your code under profiling, um, you want to call this dump stats function, which is going to basically save out all of that data uh, into a file that you can then analyze later. Um, and how you do that is using the pstats module, and, and using it looks something like this. Um, so uh, there's a lot that you can do with pstats, um, and I want to actually uh, show more than I could sort of fit onto uh, slides in any reasonable way. Uh, so let's see if, excellent, it worked. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is um, about the most simple or, or very close to the most simple uh, Hello World web app that you can write. Here I'm using Bottle. Uh, the actual framework that I'm using is sort of irrelevant and uninteresting. Um, so there's a single uh, handler in this web app uh, called slash hello. And if you pass it a name and a query string, then it's going to say hello to that name. Otherwise, it'll say hello world. Um, down at the bottom in the if name equals main section, um, you can see that little recipe where I'm setting up the profiler, uh, enabling it, running my application, um, and then because of the way that bottle works, uh, I have to kill it with control C, so I'm using a finally block to disable and save the output. Um, this is actually going to be kind of challenging to uh, type and hold the mic at the same time. Oh, that'd be awesome. So I'm going to <laughs> This is very strange because I can't find my mouse. Where is it? There it is. OK, there you go. I'll take photos of the screen <laughs> close up while you do this, too. OK, so um, I have this file here, uh, urls.txt, which just contains a whole bunch of calls to this function that we were just looking at. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, um, just run this a bunch of times uh, after I start my app. Uh, does that so actually work? You get really good bokeh by getting really close to things. So that's why I came up here on stage. Uh, okay, so that's probably enough. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just going to kill the app. Uh, in the finally block, we remember that it saved out this file, app.prof. Um, I'll move it up a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to. That's not right. Uh, okay, so uh, import pstats, 
stats is pstats, that's stats, uh, to which we pass the file name, which was app.prof. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, let's just take a basic look at what this looks like, what we get out of stats. Um, so if we call print stats, um, <clears throat> it's basically just gonna print out uh, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so the first thing that we'll notice about this, um, this was obviously a very short sort of profiling run. <clears throat> um, if you run this in, in a program that's running for even a couple of minutes, let alone hours, uh, or a much bigger program, you're gonna have a lot of stuff here. So we need some way to sort of make sense of this effectively. Um, so the first and, and most immediate thing that you should always sort of remember uh, is that print stats takes uh, an argument which will limit sort of how much it prints out. Um, so let's just take a look at 15 rows of results, so that's just about perfect. Um, so we can see that the columns here uh, on the left are the number of calls, uh, the total time, the per call time, the cumulative time, and the, uh, I think it's actually the cumulative, cumulative per call time um, for each of the rows, and what each of the rows is, is the sort of aggregate information about the invocation uh, of some particular function or method in this program. Um, this we only ran a couple of requests through, so the numbers here are mostly zero. Uh, if you're running it on something that's doing, uh, on an application that's doing something more interesting than just saying hello world, uh, you'll start to see you know, bigger numbers in some places and smaller numbers in other places. Um, this is gonna sort of help guide your, your exploration basically of this profile, um, and that's gonna sort of inform where you want to uh, spend your time optimizing your code, uh, investigating why something might be slow, et cetera. <clears throat> Um, so when you just create the stats object, it sort of initially begins life in this sort of unordered, uh, uninitialized state. Um, but fortunately, we're able to sort of sort and interact with this. So let's um, call, before we print the stats, we'll do sort, nope, sort stats. Uh, and in this case, we'll just sort by um, maybe the number of calls and then print the top 15. So here we can see that uh, in this run, we had uh, for certain methods, something on the order of 30,000 calls. Um, I may think I made maybe a total of uh, 1,500 or, or 2,000 requests to this application, something like that. Um, so we can immediately see that somewhere in here, uh, something is going on and it's calling these things sort of an awful lot of times. Um, Len is, is uh, often in profiling results, um, you know, one of the top offenders. It sort of depends on what the code is doing, obviously. Um, just a brief aside, these things that show up in the little curly braces are uh, basically built-in functions or things that are implemented in C, uh, and things that show up as path, uh, colon, uh, line number, parenthesis, function name, uh, those are functions that are defined as pure Python functions. Um, so if I wanted to see, you know, what this fget function is doing, I could just open up that file and go to that line number. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, a few other things that are interesting to know, um, and this is gonna sort of come back to uh, that point I made earlier about the horrible, ugly API, um, which is not at all documented, is that you can sort by multiple things here. Um, so what would be a good second thing to sort by? Maybe cumulative. Uh, well, actually, that's going to be the same order. How about uh, per call? P, C. Um, the set of values that are accepted here into sort stats uh, are an arbitrary set of about 30, 35, or 40 uh, abbreviations of the names of those four columns. Um, I don't know where that came from. Um, there's literally a function in this object which will sort of tell you what all of the valid things are, but not what they actually sort by. You just have to sort of experiment and play around with it. Uh, usually you can just go with the column names and that'll get you something like what you want, um, but not all of the column names are actually accepted as things that you can sort by. I don't know why this is the case. Um, it's kind of horrible, but if you do this enough, you'll just sort of learn which ones work and which ones don't uh, and get on with your life. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so that didn't actually really show anything different in the display just based on what this profiling data was. Um, but you can actually give it multiple arguments and it will sort by those things in the way, in the way that you expect. Um, 
Finally, in the print stats function, um, if I want to just look at, let's say I want to sort of ignore uh, all of the stuff that's in the standard library and I want to just focus on the stuff that's in my application, um, you can pass in uh, strings here which will basically act as filters uh, against, the, <clears throat> against the, the name column, so the rightmost column. So if I put in here app.py, uh, which was the name of the Python module that this app was defined in, um, then in this case it's actually <clears throat> only going to print out one thing because there's only one function in that module. Um, but you can imagine if you had a bigger, more complicated program that you would be able to use this to sort of filter uh, based on that stuff. Um, just to give a more complete example, if I wanted to show only the things that were uh, built-in functions or things implemented in C, uh, I can filter just by curly brace, and that's going to show me all the things that basically contain a curly brace somewhere in that name column. Um, <clears throat> so this is a pretty good start. Um, there's a few more things that I, that I think are uh, really valuable ways to explore and experiment with your profiling that are not uh, shown in any obvious way in the documentation. They are mentioned there. Um, and that's two functions. One is called print callers and print callees. Um, so they do sort of what you would expect uh, from the names. So if I wanted to find out who is actually calling the when function this many times, then rather than saying print stats, I would say print callers of when Uh, and if I zoom out a little, we'll actually be able to see where many of these things are coming from. Um, so here's uh, basically every function within this application or within this profile run uh, that called len at some point. Um, and we can see here it's sort of broken out by each caller, how many times it was called, the total time and the cumulative time um, of len for each of those calls coming from each of those places. Um, this is maybe not the most exciting example. If this function were doing something more interesting than len does, uh, you might see that we call it from some places and it takes much longer than when we call it from other places. Um, there's also print callees, which basically does the opposite of this. So if I want to find, uh, or rather look at the profiling results from everything that my hello method called, uh, I can say print call callees of hello. Um, and this is going to show me, you know, the things that are sort of direct calls uh, from here, which was query string, template, and uh, parse QS. Uh, uh, so James asked, can you create a call graph from this? Um, question, should we wait for the end, please? No. I don't care. Um, so there are, there are some tools um, that I'm not very familiar with, and I, I sort of prefer uh, life in a text world. Um, I think run snake run is the sort of common one that, that people use. Uh, it's not exactly a call graph, but it shows you sort of a, a tree map display of sort of the timing and to a certain extent the call tree. Uh, I assume that there's enough information here to create a call graph. I just don't know off the top of my head of any tools that do that. Uh, okay, so I'm running a little bit behind. I'm going to speed up here. How do I go back? Uh, okay. Um, so we just walked through sort of what profiling actually looks like. Uh, just to sort of take a, a brief retrospective on, on what we looked at, um, profiling is going to really tell us uh, where something is slow. It's not necessarily going to answer the question of why that thing is slow. That's still sort of left as an exercise to the reader. Um, but it is going to help us identify, you know, let's say that uh, we ran a uh, load test and we found that our application after making some changes is uh, half as fast as it used to be. Um, if we run a profiling run against sort of the previous and the current version, uh, by experimenting with and exploring through the profile data, we'll be able to find out uh, which parts of it have slowed down. Um, so like with all the other sorts of performance testing that we've looked at, uh, repeatability is really important. Um, we actually use the same performance testing environment, uh, basically plus a feature flag in our application to trigger profiling at Magnetic. Um, this has proved to be sort of a, a really valuable way of um, making this very easy and, and very uh, useful for developers. So we have sort of a one-click run. Uh, you can set up a, a branch of your code, um, sort of run a, a either a profile test or a stress test, uh, and then get back the results. Uh, our tests take about 40 minutes to an hour.
Um, so there are a couple of pro other profilers that uh, I don't have time to demo, but I will just briefly mention. Uh, so line profiler, profiler, as the name suggests, uh, will give you sort of line by line uh, timing information um, of code within a single function. Uh, it works uh, basically with a decorator around that function, or there's a, a different way to call it. Uh, you run that a couple of times, then it'll tell you uh, this line was executed 100 times, and it, it took uh, over those 100 times you know, this many milliseconds or this many microseconds. Um, if you've sort of identified that a single function is slow, but you can't figure out why, that's uh, a good way to go. Uh, <clears throat> there's also an alternative profiler called YAPI, which is an acronym for yet another Python profiling something. I don't know what the I stands for. Um, and the only uh, reason that I bring it up here, and, and it's actually an important one, is that the standard library profilers um, do not sort of handle threads well. So if you have threads in your program, um, when the main thread pauses during profiling, the way that that's going to show up is just that that function call sort of took longer than it, than it really did. Um, so what Yappy does is basically when the thread switches to another thread, uh, it sort of <clears throat> takes note of that and subtracts the time that another thread was executing uh, from the time that it's recording for whatever function it's profiling. Um, Yappy also collects profiling results sort of across all different threads, uh, which can be helpful uh, or maybe not, depending on uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, okay, um, so uh, the, the sort of third ingredient in our virtuous cycle uh, is instrumentation. Uh, instrumentation can mean lots of different things to lots of different people, so here's what I mean by it. Uh, I mean putting extra code into your application uh, that records things like how frequently something was called and how long it took um, when you were calling it. Uh, so this is obviously uh, a little bit similar to profiling. Uh, the difference is that instrumentation libraries are typically designed to be relatively low overhead uh, or, or very low overhead, so you can actually leave them on uh, while your application is running in production. Um, so what we use at Magnetic, uh, and it works really well for us, I recommend it to people who are doing web application types things, is uh, StatsD. Um, we actually use sort of a, a variant of StatsD uh, called Datadog. Um, <clears throat> which adds a little bit of extra uh, ability to sort of slice and dice your data, uh, as well as a um, nice web interface to, to sort of view what that looks like. Um, I'm behind, but I will show you uh, a brief example of that. Uh, or not, because my browser won't work. Um, <clears throat> but um, let's see. Uh, so what we collect uh, is, is basically these two types of, of time series metrics. So one is counters. Um, how many times did we get a request of type X? Uh, and the other are timers. How long did requests of type X take? Um, so uh, what we do is we'll, we'll basically just have these graphs uh, up and visible in our office all the time. Uh, you sort of get a feel for what looks like normal on particular days of the week or times of the day. Uh, and you can sort of quickly notice, visually notice, um, when something is out of the ordinary. Um, Datadog also lets you define alerts about that. So if uh, metric x dot y is greater than a certain value, uh, send us an alert uh, as an email. It goes to our on-call rotation. Um, it's really nice. Um, and just to show how easy it is to use, um, this is uh, literally code that would actually work. Um, so there's the statsd module, and it defines a couple of functions. The timed function works as a decorator. Uh, the increment function um, creates that counter series, uh, and it will just increment that value by um, whatever the number of arguments is. Um, this is where I would show you Datadog. Uh, okay, so finally, um, so the virtuous cycle. So this is what we've sort of been building to and what I've been talking about for the past 30 minutes. Um, basically goes like this. Uh, so we begin by sort of adding this instrumentation and alerting into our code. Um, this will basically tell us when something has gone wrong uh, or when something is out of the ordinary. Uh, when that happens, we have this automated, repeatable prof uh, performance testing environment uh, in which we can run uh, a test. That will help us sort of uh, zero in on, on perhaps you know, what service is causing trouble or uh, perhaps what part of that is causing trouble. Um, once we've narrowed it down a little bit, we'll use profiling to identify the sort of particular part of the code uh, that is performing slowly or that is having some sort of scalability issue. 
Um, and that lets us then sort of focus our optimization on just that part. Um, so Nuth famously said that premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, this is the way to know that you're not optimizing prematurely. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, any questions? Uh, so the question is, uh, in the profiling example I showed, the cumulative time and the time was all zero. Um, yeah, so um, the, I guess the, the unit here is like uh, one thousandth of the second? Uh, yeah, so um, so these are, uh, the time columns are, are in seconds. Um, so the, the resolution here is basically milliseconds. Yeah, so because it is zero, when you actually sorted it, it does not do anything just because it's zero. Can we actually change the unit here to go further? Like uh, one millionth of a second or something? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if there were documentation with the module, I would be able to give you a, a, a firm answer. Uh, there might be, but I'd have to actually like read the code to, to find out. Um, I assume that uh, the timing is stored as sort of float seconds, and so there is more resolution. Um, and you could probably customize it to, to show you what you wanted to, but I don't think there's a default option to do that. Can you tell us more about Datadog and what it does for you? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, so I, I didn't mean this to be a sales pitch, but um, I think the, the best way to do this might be just to show you a demo. No, it's, it's in the full screen thing. Hold on one sec. Uh, so this is an example of the sort of charting that Datadog gives you. Um, so this is, uh, from earlier today, actual data from our actual application. Um, the details of this aren't uh, necessarily very interesting or important until you understand what our application does. Um, but uh, just to give you sort of a brief overview, uh, on the top leftmost chart, um, we're showing the number of bids, which is basically how often we try to buy an ad, uh, an online ad. Uh, on the top right, we're seeing how often we've actually won. Um, the color codings here are basically from which of our partners we've uh, actually bought this ad or, or tried to buy this ad. Um, so by themselves, that's actually very useful data for us. If we see that sort of suddenly go up or suddenly go down, uh, that tells us something about what's going on in production right now. Um, one of the things that's really nice about Datadog is that you can actually combine these things. So in this uh, chart down here, um, we're charting rates, which is basically the ratio of the top two charts. Um, so we can see that we're winning, uh, on average, about 15% uh, of what we try to buy, um, which is sort of par for the course for us. If that suddenly went up or suddenly went down, again, we would be able to see uh, you know, something had gone wrong. Um, and then just to sort of show a, another example, this is uh, a timing chart from one of those stats d.timed calls, um, which is telling us that our 95th percentile response time is seven milliseconds. Uh, and our median response time is 3.3 milliseconds. Um, so some of the other things that Datadog gives you um, is a, a way to sort of set up a whole bunch of alerts um, about all of these different metrics. Um, they're very cheap to collect, so we have many hundreds of them uh, throughout our application. Um, you can see that some of them are actually alerting right now. I should probably go and fix that. Uh, but many of them are okay, and, and that's sort of what we like to see, and that's very good. Um, for each of these alerts, you can customize who they go to, um, whether or not they go to PagerDuty, which will alert our on-call rotation, uh, et cetera. Is that sort of what you were looking for? Uh, cool. Anyone else? Yeah. So the question was about uh, graphite, and I didn't catch the name of the other, carbon. So um, I've actually never used those myself. Um, my understanding is that they offer a lot of the same sorts of things as Datadog does. Uh, Datadog is nice because I don't have to run it. Um, these guys are a company. Uh, you know, we pay them, and they run all of this for us. Uh, and it's just one less thing that I have to deal with. Um, I think it offers sort of very similar sorts of capabilities. Um, 
and I, I, that's certainly an option that, that people should look at if you're not either willing or able to work with a vendor for this sort of stuff. Oh, one more over here. So you did briefly touch on um, when you design your uh, performance testing environment that you try to scale it to like 120th size. Um, how do you go about ensuring that that always gives you valid results? I mean, you were talking about sort of voodoo magic of comparing it to what we see in production, and while it looks like it's good enough, so we assume it's fine, basically. But do you ever actually try to do any sort of sort of empirical data to actually make sure that that actually matches up? <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'm actually really glad you brought that up. So that's one of the other things that uh, instrumentation makes um, really easy is that we have the same instr instrumentation in the per performance testing environment as well as in production, so we can actually do that sort of apples to apples comparison. Um, in our case, we cheat a little bit. We know that it's about 1 20th because our cluster is 20 machines in production and one machine with the same configuration in the performance testing environment. Um, so it's a little bit easier to do the math there and the application sort of makes it work that way. But without it, we could still use these sort of timing metrics and performance metrics to sort of extrapolate and at least guess what that factor is. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's certainly, so that certainly could be an issue. Um, so the, the question was, uh, you know, are there bottlenecks that only show up at scale? Um, yeah. Uh, and, and those are things that, you know, you still do sort of need to use your brain and, and think about your architecture and your application to, to understand where those things are and how they might impact your performance tests. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>